Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, welcome to the Four Year Innovation Podcast. My name is Dan, ARC's Client Portfolio Specialist. This podcast episode will be a little bit different than the more science and technology focused episodes you may be used to. Today, I am joined by Ren Leggy, ARC's Client Portfolio Manager, to discuss his recent market research about the equity market cap associated with technology-enabled innovation, which is on our site. It is the most recent blog post at arc-invest.com. If you'd like, you can pause and open that up and follow along with this discussion. Um, Now, before we dive into really the meat of this discussion, Ren, could you walk us through your background briefly? Sure. Thanks, Dan. So I joined ARC back in October of 2018, and I came from the due diligence side of things. I was responsible. My last role was at Capital One's Wealth and Asset Management Division, and I was responsible for uh, vetting managers, um, kind of focused more so on the equity side. Uh, really vetting managers, I, I probably sat through you know a thousand um, calls and meetings with managers, and uh, you know it really just came down to you know everyone was doing the same thing, right? Uh, and uh, it was very hard to find kind of differentiated managers out there uh, that we wanted to allocate to. Um, and so I had come across uh, Arc actually because I have a passion for for innovation and. Um, you know, started, was attracted to their research. Uh, and so it was more kind of more of a, a kind of personal curiosity uh, that that kind of led me down the innovation rabbit hole. Uh, but that that's what ultimately led me to ARK Invest. Awesome. Thank you. And, and it, innovation, it's, uh, it's captured a lot of investors' attention, especially during the pandemic. Why did that happen? And what was the result of that? No, that's a that's a good question. What we've seen is kind of an acceleration in adoption, uh, kind of a, a direct result of the pandemic, because these innovations uh, or these technologies actually solved a lot of the problems that both businesses and consumers were faced with during the pandemic, right? And so they provided products or services cheaper, faster, more efficient, and that's what really started kind of to accelerate their adoption. So. People were kind of reluctant to 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 embrace that, and and really, you know, they wanted to travel for face to face meetings. And we've seen, you know, looking back now, there's so much productivity loss associated with traveling. Right? I used to, you know, travel to Asia, the Middle East, all over visiting clients, and now I can have five meetings back to back and basically do a trip around the world um, in you know five hours. So. This, this is, we think, kind of changed our world uh, as we know it. And I think a lot of people expect, you know, to kind of go back to pre-pandemic life. And I, I think that is, you know, it's, it's going to be a hybrid, right? And I think a lot of these technologies are here to stay. And so people are maybe underestimating uh, how big these technologies are going to be. So we've seen kind of a, a very rapid acceleration and they think it'll kind of plateau and maybe even pull back. But in fact, you know, people aren't going to go back to these, these, these old ways, especially if it's cheaper and faster and more efficient. Right. So I think that will, this, this trend is going to continue and that will actually um, provide further acceleration in adoption for these technologies going forward. And and that's what we're really focused on. We're, We're thinking about this, not maybe next year, but more so kind of in the, three, five, even 10 year time horizon. Great. And, and 
uh, how, how is ARC looking at this and kind of breaking up the world to focus on uh, the, the many different avenues of innovation? Yeah, so we, we center all of our research on what we call five innovation platforms. And, you know, this is this is something we, we, we didn't make up, right? We subscribe to kind of the theory of general purpose technologies. And our, our director of research, Brett Witten, goes in depth into these, these platforms and that theory. Uh, but what we've looked at is kind of what the criteria is over time, what would define what an innovation platform is and when it's investable. Right. And so the five platforms that we think are investable now are DNA sequencing, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we have energy storage, robotics and blockchain technology. And if you look at maybe back to kind of, you know, the, the pandemic, if you look at pre pandemic levels, So at the end of 2019, if you look at the technologies and the underlying companies associated with those platforms, we saw that the total market cap. Uh, attributable to those five platforms at the end of 2019 was roughly seven trillion, and because of that acceleration in adoption, we're now at, uh, according to our our research and our estimates, we think that is closer to 14 trillion dollars in market cap. So it's it's basically doubled in just one year. So if you look at kind of the end of 2020, that number has gone from seven to to 14. Uh, trillion in those underlying five innovation platforms. Now, when you look at those flat five platforms, they really, you know, there's 14 underlying technologies that I would associate with those five platforms. And, and so we're seeing kind of that acceleration really across, across those 14 technologies. And, and again, these are, these are technologies that we believe are here to stay. They're gaining traction and they're investable now. So, so yeah, I, I want to combine that last point. Investable now is with the number 14 trillion that you had mentioned. That that sounds like a really large number, 14 trillion. But when I think about it from just a broad capacity point of view, it feels a bit small. I, can you maybe help me understand that? What am I missing there? Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought, right? You know, most traditionally, when you think about kind of institutional you know, consultants and how they assess, uh, you know, a strategy's capacity, they tend to look at kind of the benchmark to that strategy, right? And they look at the total market cap of that benchmark and kind of, you know, look at the, you know, the, the percentage of that, of that benchmark or index that that strategy is following, right? So we, we've seen, and, and even this goes back to some of my, my work that I've done in my prior roles, right? When you're looking at small cap managers, for instance, right? And you see that, you know, the, the, the market cap of some of these indices are in the low double digit billions that, you know, likely for a small cap type strategy, you know, it could be depending on, on you know, where they, what their average market cap is, it could be maybe only a billion, maybe two billion. In some cases where it kind of pushes up into the SMID space could be five billion. That's how they think, you know, in terms of determining capacity and, you know, say, Take for for instance, like a small cap value strategy, right? That's pretty static in terms of the size of that market cap. And so, when you look at the index that's backward looking, um, you know that that becomes kind of less relevant when you're talking about innovation that's expanding in market cap, right? I mean, just in one year alone, evidence we've seen that it, it has doubled, right, from seven trillion to fourteen trillion. And we actually think because of this acceleration. Some of our forecasts, and we, we do this work, so on, on an annual basis, we, we publish our big ideas presentation, which really showcases the top-down work that we do at the underlying technology level. And as we're going through some of these, these updated forecasts and, and pushing them forward, in some cases, we're looking at what, what 2030 will look like. Uh, we think that these five platforms combined will create actually uh, in excess of $200 trillion dollars worth of business value and wealth creation. So we went from seven to 14 to now, you know, by within less than 10 years could be at, at um, over 200 trillion. So that, that, that's a big number. And you would expect capacity to kind of scale exponentially when you're talking about innovation. Okay. So, so 14 to over 200 trillion by 2030, I think is what I, I heard from you there. It, that jumps off the page a little bit. Uh, can you maybe just help me understand that growth a little bit better? Like, wh wh what am I missing? What's really going to drive that? 
Sure. I mean, so one of the things that I think a lot of investors and, and really the market is kind of underestimating is, is the convergence between and among these technologies, right? And in fact, Kathy and, and Brett are, are working on a piece, maybe the, the next blog or, or white paper, uh, around this convergence in technologies and how these S-curves are actually leading to this exponential growth opportunity uh, in the next five, 10 years. So you know, a good example would be in the genomic space, right? There, there's really kind of three technologies that are now converging uh, that is creating, we believe is going to create a tremendous amount of value in terms of the underlying companies associated with some of these underlying genomics focused technologies. So you take CRISPR gene editing or just broadly gene editing, combine that with DNA sequencing, and then you combine that uh, with artificial intelligence. And that kind of supercharges um, you know, the impact of these technologies that we'll have on the overall market and create this value uh, that we will likely see in the coming years. So you, know, you have three technologies. Initially, you know, we were very focused on gene editing, DNA sequencing, kind of a little bit more. I mean, they were certainly related, but they were kind of looking at them separately. But now that these two worlds are starting to converge, we're using, for instance, long read sequencing uh, to determine some of the off-target effects that CRISPR gene editing is having. Um, so, And then we're using AI to really understand all the massive amounts of data that's being created using DNA sequencing and long read sequencing. So, you know, these, these technologies are converging. And that, I think, is really been kind of the key factor that investors have been really underestimating when they're assessing the, the, the impact of these technologies. Thanks. So, so, you know, convergence being the key there to this growth, how, how can I monitor this growth and, and kind of gauge where, you know, how it's moved over time as I watch it scale from, you know, by your expectations, 14 to over 200? I, it, it's difficult for me to sort of point to some kind of benchmark and just know, you know, this is how I can track this. Can you help me with that a bit? No, it's it's something that uh, a challenge that I I faced with you know earlier in in my career as well, right? Um, you know, luckily or, or thankfully, to MSCI uh, recognized this, and just recently they have launched a suite of innovation based indices, and you know now we kind of have a, a bit of a sense of of how to measure this over time, and so they launched the MSCI Acqui IMI Innovation Index. And what we can see there, you know, we, we've actually pulled some of, and this is, this is in the blog, right? We pulled some third-party data from them, kind of validate what we're seeing in innovation, right? And, and so this is serving as kind of a, a way to, to kind of measure it, the, the growth in, in global, global innovation. And we're seeing that the market cap uh, is expanding for these opportunities. And, and we're seeing it even in the underlying MSCI innovation index. So you know, in terms of the number of names in that index, we've seen it triple. You know, we're seeing the number of names increase. That is also expanding capacity for innovation. We're also seeing the increase in the, the percentage market share of the broader market. So innovation as a percentage of the overall global equity market cap has expanded. It's gone from 3% to 18% now. So it's taking a larger share. And, uh, you know, we see investors are starting now they have kind of they, they can see this data. Right. And, you know, I always I always go back to the emerging markets as an example in the late uh, 1980s uh, and early 90s, where MSCI recognized this pretty early on as well. A lot of investors didn't have exposure to emerging markets and they created a suite of indices to track those underlying companies in each of those local emerging markets and gave investors a way to, to invest in them. And I think this is, this is what they're, they're doing now with innovation. So it's provided us with you know, additional data points that we can point to that you know, provide some insight into how innovation is expanding over time and how we believe it will continue to expand. Interesting, okay. So, so yeah, you're seeing a lot of expansion, just a number of names as, as well as gaining market share on the rest of the global uh, market cap. So I. I'm I'm beginning to understand a little bit why you, how and why you can see you know this capacity growing over time, but you know what what I kind of come back to and what's in the back of my mind right now is a lot of these names you know it's it's early innings 
uh, and they can be a bit illiquid, uh, you know, just being smaller. And, and, you know, many of them, they're not really popular holdings. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how you kind of think in terms of that, you know, liquidity of that index and these innovative names. Yes, no, that, that's certainly a, a topic that comes up very often, right? When, when people associate innovation as kind of the, the smaller cap names, and what we've seen is, and, and we pulled some data from MSCI again, they had conducted some analysis on the average days to trade the MSCI ACWI IMI Innovation Index. And so if you go back to the end of, of 2013, the average days to trade was roughly about 85 days, right? And if you look at that, fast forward, you know, seven years that we have data, that has been on a rapid decline. And I think right around kind of midway through 2017, it dropped pretty significantly to below 10 days. And now it's on average, it's at 2.7 days uh, to trade. And so that I think really suggests how liquidity has improved for innovation over time. And we would expect that number to continue because of how innovation is continuing to expand and and more opportunities coming to market. So, you know, that should only improve over time. We're also seeing the market caps of these underlying innovative companies expand organically, right? And so, you know, we're starting to see the market caps push up and, and we're seeing a lot of these innovative names come in, you know, maybe at, at kind of the higher end of the small cap uh, spectrum. In, in some cases, we're seeing that, you know, when you talk about how these, you know, how the adoption rate of these five platforms have accelerated, you know, we're seeing that it may not make sense to invest in these smaller, almost binary companies, right? When you're looking at kind of an innovation platform within, you know, energy storage, such as uh, electric vehicles, right? You know, it's going to take a lot to compete with a company like, say, Tesla, that's really starting to, to dominate market share there. You know, the competition we'll likely see maybe coming from the traditional auto space rather than kind of a, a private company that that really doesn't have a, a proof of concept yet. So naturally, we're starting to see a lot more opportunities start to come into the, to our portfolios, maybe at the, the mid to even large cap sizes. OK, interesting. So so you, know, you talked about the you know, gaining in the size as well. This this index, is it U.S. focus? Because innovation, you know, it, it cuts across geographies. It's a, it's a global concept. I'm curious if I can get a little more uh, understanding of that there. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, again, we, we went to MSCI for some of this data to, to validate what we were seeing in our own portfolios. But we're seeing a lot of innovation, um, you know, it really started in, in the U.S. A lot of these platforms really date back to kind of the time of the Internet, the early 90s. That's when they, the seeds were first planted for some of these technologies. And, and they've grown over the last 20, 30 years. But a lot of them started in the U.S. and have expanded. And so we're seeing that across countries within Asia, Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa, that this is kind of a, you know, they're, they're starting to compete with some of these U.S. names or going after these opportunities that they realize are so massive in their local economies. And so innovation is really starting to expand beyond just the U.S., beyond just Silicon Valley. We've seen it expand throughout the U.S., in different uh, different cities popping up around around the country, now it's really starting to pop up globally as well. And so, when we look at some of the data from MSCI and, and looking at their index, we've seen that if you look at the number of international stocks, right, going back to uh, the end of 2013, uh, it, it basically has doubled in the last seven years from 98 names to uh, 209 names. We think that trend will continue just based on what we're seeing where innovation. So we're, we're starting to see a lot more names pop up that are associated with these five platforms, again, in, in areas, uh, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East and Europe as well. OK, so number of names just increasing. And you had mentioned that earlier as well. That kind of makes me think here, you know, a, a trend that had been going on for quite some time was just private companies staying private for longer. Isn't that shrinking the capacity for innovation, not expanding it? You know, it's interesting. It's actually quite the opposite now. Uh, that had been kind of, I would say, a trend for the last decade or so, right? We've seen a lot of, you know, the Ubers and others, a lot of these unicorns staying private for much longer. And I think really, really around the pandemic, 
that trend has actually started to reverse. And so we've seen a huge surge in the number of initial public offering IPOs. If you also include direct listings, we also include SPACs. Um, and these tend to be kind of those innovative names. And if you just look at the data going back to 1999, right? So which, which started with, you know, kind of the, the internet bubble, right? That, that was the last high where we've seen, you know, anywhere from five to 600 IPOs, uh, I think it was in 99 and, and 2000. That number has surpassed um, in 2021, just year to date. And I think the data that we have is through the end of October has reached 755 IPOs, which again includes direct listings and SPACs. We've, we've kind of hit an all-time high. And even if you look at you know, 2020, that number was kind of surpassed kind of the, the, I guess the shorter term average, which was in the two to 300 range, that was around 428 IPOs. And so that number is expanding, expanding. And we think that will also further expand innovation and the number of companies we have the ability to invest in because we're focused and, and where we still think where, where most of the inefficiencies really lie is innovative companies within the public equity space. And so that universe of stocks for us to choose from as active managers in that space is expanding. And, and I think that data kind of supports that case that we're seeing it tends to be a lot more innovative companies coming to market. And because the reason behind that, I think, is because, you know, these, these companies, in order to stay competitive and in order to really expand, they need to turn to the capital, the capital markets to fund these opportunities. So when you're looking at R&D costs, capital expenditures, and even to fund some of these, you know, strategic and maybe even more aggressive acquisitions that to help them stay ahead of their incumbents, you know, they're turning to the capital markets. It's, it's a lot easier to scale uh, as a company within the public equity markets. Um, and they're coming in, you know, at, at pretty attractive, we believe, pretty attractive valuations if they're raising equity that will fund kind of their, their longer term growth. All right. So, so I had that a bit backwards in my head there. There are actually more going public now. Uh, than staying private for too long. Uh, I guess may, maybe up to this point, I, I think I should summarize things a bit here. Uh, there, it sounds like there are really three dynamics evolving. Uh, you know, there, there's a introduction to innovation-based indexes, so investors can kind of follow along and, and watch this progress and, and see what's happening. Uh, there, I think you mentioned as well uh, a global expansion. You know, this isn't just Silicon Valley or or in the U.S. solely. It's global. And then finally, what you just touched on, you know, more companies coming public than staying private for too long uh, to, to gain access to capital and fight for these, uh, you know, large opportunities. Based on all that uh, and, you know, all, all these points of leading to capacity expansion, I, I guess my question would be, what do you think your capacity could be? You know, it, it's it's a question that comes up pretty often, right? And and because it's you know it's constantly expanding, you, you have to constantly reassess, right? And and certainly as it expands exponentially, it becomes a little harder to kind of forecast exactly what capacity could be. But I mean, just thinking about you know the fourteen trillion that we're at today, right? Uh, Arcs Arcs AUM is roughly in the you know sixty five billion. You know, we're we're still just a fraction of a percent versus the total market cap of uh, publicly traded what we would deem kind of innovative companies. And if we expect this going to you know over two hundred trillion by twenty thirty, I mean, even if our assets were to grow to a trillion dollars in in twenty thirty, we would still be only just a fraction of a percent. So. You know, we think we still have a lot of, of room to grow uh, and capacity, you know, for innovation will expand over time. Okay. Yeah. When, when you kind of put the numbers behind it, that makes a lot more sense. I, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and just talk about innovation kind of a different light here. It, it's very controversial. And that leads to a lot of volatility in the markets for these types of, uh, you know, investments, which can scare investors and allocators. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, you know, what, how do you view volatility? Yes. I mean, so a lot of investors just generally associate volatility, certainly with risk, but 
they, they associate it with down markets. And, you know, from our perspective, volatility isn't necessarily a bad word. And it maybe even may not be when you're talking about innovation, you know, the best measure of risk. And we, we think we'll likely see higher volatility market environment going forward. And it could be driving actually upward market movements. So volatility can, can come in, in, in two forms. And so it really shouldn't be looked at as kind of a, you know, a bad word. You can be in an upward market with higher volatility. And we would expect this higher volatility because of the potential disruption that's happening out there in the markets, right? And so as we start to see this increased volatility, maybe it starts with some of these innovation-based companies. You know, we use that as kind of an opportunity to take advantage of, you know, whether it's a market sell-off or just increased volatility and our stocks just moving around in the short term. Our time horizon is a minimum five years, right? So we, we have the ability and flexibility to kind of pick our spots. Um, you know, we, we, we think of ourselves as long-term investors, but really short-term contrarians. And so, again, we can kind of use that volatility to our advantage. Maybe let me just dive in on that last point a little bit. Using the volatility to your advantage, can, can you expand on that? You know, how how are you actually taking advantage of that volatility? Yeah, so we we've conducted a number of analysis on just kind of we're looking at kind of market expansions and contraction periods, and what we've done in, historically in our portfolios in a market contraction what we tend to do is consolidate and concentrate into our highest conviction names, right? So as uh, we see investors kind of flock back to safety in these kind of what we would deem as risk off environments, they tend to abandon their kind of off benchmark names, which tend to be mainly innovation or higher growth names or even higher beta names because they're not part of the broader based indices. So they flock back to that safety and so as a result, a lot of these innovative companies are disproportionately punished. And, you know, from our perspective, nothing's really changing from a long-term perspective on whether it's the technology or the underlying company. Um, and so that, from a valuation standpoint, we just see that, you know, some of our stocks just got much cheaper than they were. And so, you know, we look at that five-year expected return on the stock based on our five-year expected price target. And we see that compound annual growth rate increasing, meaning that it's becoming more attractively valued. And so we can have the opportunity to concentrate into those names, really buy into that weakness as long as our long-term conviction in the underlying company remains intact. In some cases, it could even be our conviction is increasing. And so um, that they may even further justify taking a larger position in some of these names. And, you know, one of the, the things that I think go overlooked as well is people associate kind of back to volatility, right, where people look at the underlying technologies and they say, oh, genomics, that is just way too risky, way too volatile. But when you compare, you know, genomic stocks to, say, robotic stocks or even you know, some blockchain related stocks, they have very low correlation. And I think that's what creates um, opportunities for us to really trade around the volatility. So, you know, we, we see that because these, these companies are moving in different directions, we can maybe trim from an area that is holding up, you know, maybe we see some of our energy storage or robotic stocks holding up pretty well in a broader market sell-off, or maybe just a rotation from growth to value, because they they tend to have a little bit more of a of a value or cyclical tilt, and so we can you know use some of those proceeds and trade and buy into the weakness in, in other technologies. So I think it provides not only diversification across the portfolio, but it also creates opportunities for us to trade around some of these technologies and the, and the underlying names associated with them. Uh, and we've seen that taking kind of more of an active approach has helped kind of, you know, lead to improved results, uh, according to some of the data that we've, we've seen in our own strategies, right, versus just taking more of a buy and hold, because innovation is, is constantly evolving. And, and the leader today may not be kind of the leader next month. And so, you know, as our views change, 
we incorporate that into the portfolio. We don't we don't say, hey, we found this great stock. We're going to hang on to it for five years. If we see a lot of volatility in the market, we can kind of trade around that volatility. You know, we can try to um, capture some trading alpha on those positions. Okay. So, yeah. So, so you're taking, you know, that that increased volatility and innovation, you're kind of taking that, you know, to your own advantage, like you said, and, and waiting for the best opportunities. When I think about this in, 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 a, in a larger portfolio sense, uh, you know, you had mentioned how there, there's diversification benefits among those technologies within the portfolio. I'm trying to think a lot of portfolios out here that investors have, they tend to be more traditional asset class focused. So if you take innovation and you put it into one of these portfolios, have you done any work on on kind of like what that can look like and how that can impact a portfolio? Yes, no, we have. And I think a lot of investors, you know, they, they look at innovation based strategies like ARCs and they say, hey, this has high volatility, high standard deviation. If you look at it historically, surely this will kind of increase the potential risk in my current portfolio. And actually what we've seen is the correlations between innovation and just kind of using, you know, ARC innovation strategy as just kind of a, a proxy for innovation. Kind of this is pre-MSCI launch uh, of the in innovation indices. So, you know, that was unfortunately the, the only proxy we could use. But when you're looking at that, and we think it still holds true today, right? When you when you use that as a proxy, you can see that the correlations between other equity asset classes and even even non-equity asset classes. So if, certainly, I think that that's the case. You know, we believe that's certainly the case for fixed income and and you know alternatives. That innovation has, although within kind of equity, it may be positively correlated, but it's it's not strongly positively correlated. You don't benefit from kind of the, the diversification uh, impact, right? So when you look at you know, maybe maybe kind of expand on this point further. You know, when you look at kind of the correlations between, say, U.S. stocks and developed international, and then maybe emerging markets, which most investors have in their portfolio, you're looking at correlations that are in kind of the 0.9 to to one, right? So very correlated. When you look at innovation, that tends to be we've seen numbers, you know, as low as 0.6 upwards to kind of point point uh, seven. Uh, and so that there's there's definitely we think diversification benefits, uh, which would show, you know, according to some of these studies that we've done, improvement in actually the risk return for a total portfolio. We've we've even seen, uh, which was actually pretty shocking, even shocking to myself, uh, that the the max drawdown when you include innovation in a traditional equity global equity portfolio was actually improved. So both max drawdown and sort sortino ratio, which kind of is focused more on the downside deviation, actually improved as you start to allocate to innovation. And we looked at various kind of weightings, you know, anywhere from 5% to 15%, even upwards to, to 20%. And we've seen that impact improve not only return, but also kind of that downside case as well. Okay, so what what I'm getting is that you know the volatility of innovation in, in isolation, uh, you know when you add that to a port total portfolio, that volatility is not the biggest risk, uh, you know because because of all those factors you mentioned, the correlation and diversification improvements. So I, I guess my question would you to you would be, you know, what is the biggest risk? You know that, that's that's a that's a great question, right? Um, you know, people people just think about that volatility as the risk, but I would say probably the biggest risk out there for investors right now is the fact that they are so under allocated to innovation, and I think that's that's kind of a direct result of of how these benchmarks and ind indices are structured, right? They're they're again they're backward looking. And they're, you know, many of them are, are, are rules based or market cap weighted, which really just rewards kind of past success. And we know that that's not indicative of future success. So if you look at a lot of these innovative companies, especially those that we are investing in, they're not part of those broader based indices. If you look at the underlying companies of those five innovation platforms, you're not going to find them in the S&P 500. You're, you're not going to find many of them in even the NASDAQ, right, which is generally more associated with technology and maybe the technology sector, you know, we're talking about innovation and innovation goes beyond 
the technology sector, right? This is, we're talking about companies and technologies that are going to impact every single industry and sector out there. And we think, you know, when we look at the S&P 500, for instance, we think, you know, roughly 50% of the companies in the S&P 500 today are at risk of being disrupted over the next five to 10 years. And so that's a risk. When you, when you think about, I think the latest number that I've seen in terms of assets linked to the S&P 500 index, I think it was around 12 to $13 trillion linked to that index. So there's a lot of capital linked to that index. And if we're right about the potential disruption, whether it comes from you know, a traditional auto manufacturers because of EVs and how they're taking share from gas powered vehicles, or if it, it comes from digital wallets taking customers you know, from, from traditional banking, you know, these, these make up pretty significant weights in the S&P 500. And so we think investors ought to have a, a hedge against that potential disruption if, they're, you know, if they have a lot of exposure to some of these broader based indices. If we're right, we should help hedge against that disruption right? Provi- by providing, because we're focused on, on the future. We're always looking five years out, minimum. Um, and, and in some cases, some of these technologies you have to look 10 years out. Um, but we keep looking at and identifying those leading edge companies that aren't part of those broad-based indices. They will become eventually those part of the, the broader-based indices, but they're not, they may not be there yet. And investors should have some exposure, we think, to these names. And, you know, when they become, eventually they do graduate and they kind of meet, you know, the, the requirements of one of these broader based indices, then they'll become part of investors' core portfolios and they'll likely not be part of our portfolios. And so we'll, we'll constantly be looking at these for these new leading edge companies. And that's what we're going to have in an innovation based strategy like, like, like ARCs, right? Kind of that forward looking exposure but also hedging against that potential disruption in their current portfolio. You've certainly given me a lot to think about. I think I need to you know, sit back and digest this a little and, and think about how my own portfolio looks. You know, one, Once again, too, for those listening, uh, a lot of what Ren's covered today is in his recent blog, which you can find on arc-invest.com under the Research Center tab. Uh, and Ren, I just want to say thank you again for joining the podcast today. Uh, very insightful commentary. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Dan. A lot of great questions. Appreciate it. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.